Hello and welcome to today's lecture. In this part of the lecture, we will look at localization. So localization is a technique in commutative algebra that's useful both in algebra and in geometry. Its use in geometry is when we want to look locally at points in some variety or some such thing, and that gives it the name localization. But the idea is more general than that. So we start with a unital commutative ring R, and we look at a suitable set of elements in R, and we want to say that we want to invert these elements. So we want to add to the ring R all the inverses of the elements in S, which are not defined in R, so we want to be able to define the motivating example that you have seen before is the construction of the rational numbers from the integers. So how is that done? Well, you start with the integers and you look at the set of all non-zero integers. This is our set S. And we want to add to Z the inverses in some way of all elements in S. But how is this done formally? What does it mean to add an inverse? We, I mean, Strictly speaking, these elements are in general not invertible. So remember that if you have seen this before, this is how it is done. So before you can define what a rational number is, you look at pairs of uh, elements, A, S, where A is an integer, so an element of R, and S belongs to this set S of non-zero integers. And you declare two such pairs equivalent if they satisfy this uh, property. And then you look at the equivalence classes of this relation that you can show is an equivalence relation. And you call such an equivalence class A over S. So this relation just says that A over S S is equal to multiples u a time divided by u s. So these correspond to the same rational number, and this is what this equivalence relation is all about. And then you define addition and multiplication of such equivalence classes in the way you remember from primary school, and this gives you precisely the rational numbers. Now, how do we do this in general? So we look at an arbitrary unital commutative ring R. And the first observation is that we will not be able to add inverses of just about any arbitrary subset, but only multiplicatively closed subsets. So a subset is called multiplicatively closed if whenever two elements are in it, then their product is in it. And also you require that the empty product, the uh, identity element of the ring, belongs to the uh, set S. And now on the product R times S of pairs of elements from R and S, we define more or less the same equivalence relation as we did when we defined uh, the rational numbers and that is that A S is equivalent to A prime S prime if and only if A S prime minus A prime S times some element in S is equal to zero. So if there exists such an element in S that makes this product zero, then we view these as equivalent. And then you can check that the set of all equivalence classes with addition and multiplication defined like this. All of this is well defined and forms a ring. And this is what we call the localization of the ring R at the multiplicatively closed set S. So what about this element U? Well, this is necessary to make the relation transitive. 
And also, you note that if R is an integral domain, then the existence of an element u such that uh, this becomes zero boils down to your difference itself being zero because there are no zero divisors. One has to be careful because of course, in principle, and this is important, I can include zero in my multiplicative set S, but that would be very bad because then the uh, localization I would get would just be the trivial ring. So you can check this fact. And so my statement should be corrected as saying that if, you're, if R is an integral domain and zero is not in your multiplicative set S, then you can do without this U and you get the usual rule we had for rational numbers. But at any rate, this general definition gives you a ring. And the point is that now elements of S are invertible. So if I multiply the element S divided by one by one divided by S, I get one for all S in S. So some remarks. As with the uh, point of view that any integer is a rational number with denominator 1, there is a natural map from the ring R to uh, the localization with respect to S, and it's defined in the following way. You map an element A to the quotient A divided by 1. But note that this is in general not injective. It is injective if and only if set S does not contain zero divisors. So why is that? Well, call this map Yota. And so what is the kernel of Yota? So this is the set of all A such that A is mapped to the same thing as zero, which means that there exists U in S such that U times a times 1 minus 1 times 0 equals 0, or the existence of u in S such that u A is equal to 0. So if u is a 0 divisor, then for some non-zero A, this will be possible. And note that the fact that S uh, contains zero divisors is not the same as S containing zero, even though it's multiplicatively closed. Think about why this is the case. And as uh, I just used in the proof of the previous uh, remark, the zero element is the class of zero, one, and the unity is the class of one, one. If you localize with respect to the uh, unity element, so you have the, the smallest possible multiplicatively closed set, then of course you are not adding anything and so this map is isomorphic. You get simply your ring R as the localization. At the other end of the spectrum, well, if zero is in S, then you can check that this is the trivial ring. But also the most important example is when you take all elements except zero. So as large as possible without ruining everything, then the uh, localization is the field of fraction. You should recognize this as the definition of the field of fraction from earlier uh, courses in algebra, or indeed from our example with the integers and the rational numbers. But there are some other important examples. So you can localize at an element. What is meant by this is that you look at an element A in R and you consider to make this into a multiplicative set all powers of A, all positive powers. Then this is a 
uh, I mean, all, all positive powers and, of course, the unity. This is a multiplicatively closed set. And the name for this is the localization of R at the element A. And you denote it by R sub A. So R sub A is simply this localization uh, with respect to that set. The other uh, example is the localization at a prime ideal. So you consider a prime ideal and look at the set of all elements in R that are not in P. So this is multiplicatively closed. That is just the definition of a prime ideal. So if A does not belong to P and B does not belong to P, then also the product does not belong to P. That's the definition of a prime ideal. And the localization with respect to this multiplicative set is called the localization of R at the prime ideal P, and you denote it by R sub P. So note the potential confusion between these two notations that are unfortunately both classical. R sub A, where A is an element, there you invert all powers of A. So A is among the things you invert. But R sub P, where P is a prime ideal, they, there you invert everything except what is in P. So P is exactly the things that you do not invert. Now, when you localize, you want to uh, understand what happens between the prime ideals in your original ring and the prime ideals in the localization. And now we are localizing with respect to an arbitrary multiplicatively closed set. So denoting this canonical map that I called Yota earlier by sigma, we have the following. So for each ideal in the localization, the pre-image is an ideal in R. This is nothing special about the localization. This is true for any ring homomorphism. The pre-image of an ideal is an ideal. The special thing about this situation is that this association, to associate to each ideal in the uh, localization, its pre-image. This defines a bijection between the set of all prime ideals in the localization and the set of all prime ideals in R that do not intersect S. So why is this true? Well, there are multiple things to check. First of all, you need to check that if J is prime, so if the ideal J in S inverse R is prime, then sigma inverse of J is prime. So this is an exercise. And also you need to check that sigma inverse of J does not intersect S. And the reason for that is that if it did intersect S, this means that in the pre-image of J, there are some elements of S meaning that in J, there are some units of the localization, yeah, because uh, S uh, will be, all the elements of S will be invertible in the localization, that's the whole point. And if the ideal contains um, invertible elements, then it is the whole ring, so it cannot be a prime ideal. So that's something you need to check. And now to check that this is a bijection, well, uh, we want to have a two-sided inverse. So the inverse will go from prime ideals of uh, R such that the intersection with S is empty two prime ideals of S, of the localization. And what you do is you take an ideal J here 
and you map it to the ideal generated by the image. So in general, the image of an ideal under a ring homomorphism is not an ideal, so you take the ideal generated by it, and you use primeness of J and the fact that um, the localization is defined as it is to show that this is well defined and is a two-sided inverse. to the map constructed above. And I leave the details of this to you. So as a corollary, if now our localization is not with some arbitrary multiplicatively closed set S, but with respect to a prime ideal, so S remember means that the elements uh, of S are those that do not belong to the prime ideal, then we now have a bijection between the set of prime ideals in the localization and the set of prime ideals contained in P. This is just because contained in P means that they do not intersect the complement of P. So that follows immediately from the previous proposition. And this will bring us to some interesting property of such localizations, localizations with respect to prime ideals. Namely, these will be local rings. So what is a local ring? A ring, unital commutative ring, again, is called local if it has exactly one maximal ideal. This might seem unnatural, but you will see geometric examples later on that will motivate this definition. And the proposition is that if you localize with respect to a prime ideal P, then the localization is a local ring and the unique maximal ideal will be the set of quotients A divided by S, where A is in P and S is not in P. So why is that? Well, if you take an, uh, a maximal ideal, if you take J, a maximal ideal in RP, then denoting by sigma, again, this canonical map from R to RP, we have that sigma inverse of J. This is a prime ideal contained in P. So this is because maximal ideals are prime ideals. So if it's maximal, it is prime. And so by the previous corollary, uh, its pre-image is a prime ideal, and it is a prime ideal contained in P. Yeah, but the maximal such prime ideal is um, P. So this means that J is contained in the ideal generated by the image of P. So this map respects inclusions and so J is contained in this ideal, which is this thing. And if you have a maximal ideal that is contained in some ideal, then it must be equal to it. So therefore, this is the only maximal ideal or all ideals are contained in this. Another way to view this is that um, if you take this, if you take any element that is outside this thing, then that would be an invertible element in the localization. So any ideal containing more than this thing, uh, not necessarily containing this whole thing, but any ideal containing an element that's outside here will contain an invertible element and therefore will be the whole ring. So you cannot expand your ideals beyond this one. All right. So 